Hi there. My name is Tom Morgan, and I'm a stuntman, and I worked on a great deal of Star Trek. I started uh, doing Star Trek the motion picture doubling Leonard Nimoy. I did Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. So I had about 20 years worth of Star Trek, and it was a lot of fun. We'll talk about it, and you're listening to Trek Untold. Hello and welcome to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. It's safe to say that while I really enjoy chatting with all the different guests I've had on this show so far, one of my absolute favorites are the stunt performers. It could be that I wanted to pursue that profession for quite some time, or it could just be that I really appreciate a good fight scene, and in particular a good and meaningful action scene that's directed and composed like a symphony, because yes, that's how I view action scenes. And I could easily spend an entire show just defining what I'm talking about, but I think that's going to be a totally different podcast. But point being, whenever I have the chance to speak with someone who is a stunt performer, I'm never going to say no to them. And today, I've got a really great one, because we're speaking with Tom Morga. Tom holds a record for being the most seen stunt performer in all of Star Trek history, and has been literally every alien you can think of on the show. Tom began his time on Star Trek working on the very first motion picture as one of Leonard Nimoy's stunt doubles and he appeared in nearly all of the original cast movies in some capacity, including an unused character from the fifth movie, and playing the role of the Brute when Marcia, played by Amon, shapeshifts into that ape-like character in Star Trek VI. Tom went on to perform stunts in TNG, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and even showed up again in Star Trek Nemesis. He also served as assistant stunt coordinator alongside Dennis Madalone, who we spoke to not that long ago on this show. Outside of Star Trek, Tom holds the distinction of being one of the few actors to be Leatherface, Michael Myers, and Jason Voorhees on screen, and has worked on the Sam Raimi Spider-Man film, Independence Day, Deep Impact, Army of Darkness, Problem Child, Deadwood, Turner and Hooch, Police Academy 2, several films in the Pirate of the Caribbean series, about 100 other films and TV shows, and most importantly for me, besides Star Trek, of course, is Ghostbusters. So yeah, we're going to talk a lot about that today, too. Tom's story of how he got involved in stunts in the first place is also a pretty surprising and unique one, and his contributions to TV and film cannot be overlooked. As a stunt performer, you may not always see his face or hear his voice in the roles he plays, so today it's my honor to make sure that you get to learn about this prolific performer and just a handful of his accomplishments in the stunt and film industry. So quiet on the set, get your safety harness all rigged up, because today we're having a really great chat with Tom Morga. But before we jump into today's interview, I want to ask you if you're following us yet on social media. If you're not, you can check out Trek Untold on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and we update there constantly. It's the best way to find out who this week's guest is going to be in advance, and also potentially ask them any questions when we offer that option. So that's Trek Untold, one word, no spaces, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. If you'd like to help support the show, you can check out teespring.com slash stores slash Trek Untold to take a look at some of the merchandise we have there, which includes t-shirts hoodies, mugs, stickers, and all sorts of other things. We'll be releasing new designs constantly, so make sure to keep an eye there if you'd like to support this show and show off to your friends how much you like it. You can also directly support this show by visiting patreon.com slash trekuntold to become a Patreon. But most important of all, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast, and if you're listening to it on iTunes, Spotify, Google, or any other audio forms, make sure to leave a review and a rating and drop some stars if you can. And if you're watching the YouTube version, please don't forget to subscribe to Nerd News Today, the channel that you're watching this on, and give the video a thumbs up. And of course, while you're at it, feel free to comment there and let me know what you think of this week's guest. Subscribing, leaving ratings, leaving comments are all some of the most important things you can do to help this podcast continue to grow and ensure that more people find out about this show. And if you're already following us or supporting us on Patreon or have bought some merch, a big, big thank you for doing that or offering your support in whatever way that you can. Thank you for the help. There's a lot of Star Trek podcasts out there, and I'm very grateful that you've chosen to listen to this one today. I'd also like to make a quick shout out to our sponsor at Triple Fiction Productions, who makes some amazing 3D printed Star Trek inspired dioramas and props for both Star Trek action figures and Star Trek fans in person. Whether you're a cosplayer or a toy collector, there's plenty of stuff to check out from Triple Fiction Productions, but you're going to hear a little bit more about them later on. Now, without further ado, let's beam up today's guest. Computer, access interview file.
and welcome back to Trek Untold. And now joining me on the other side of the screen, we've got a man who you've maybe seen his face in Star Trek. You maybe haven't because he's been in a lot of episodes and sometimes that face is quite covered up. If you check his memory alpha page, you will see that he is listed as too many to name because that's how many roles he's been on Star Trek. Today, we're talking with stuntman extraordinaire, Mr. Tom Morga. Tom, how are you today? Fine. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I just want to mention to my viewers and the audience out there today, I actually had a chance to meet you in person back at Ghostbusters Fan Fest last year. Uh, and you were like one of the nicest people I met there. I really loved it. So I'm glad I get to spend some time chatting with you today. But I like to start this podcast kind of chronologically. And I'd like to ask the first question to you is, what is the earliest memory you have of Star Trek? Oh, well, when it came out on TV. <laughs> and when it first came out, I was uh, actually, uh, in a, I think, when did it start? 60? You know the date for the first Star Trek, but it was '66. Uh, yeah, I was in the service at that time, so I didn't watch a lot of TV. And then, of course, after Star reruns, we all watched it, and, and uh, um, it was interesting to get a call when they did Star Trek the Motion Picture, and I had pretty good. Uh, I made a pretty good double for uh, Leonard Nimoy, so I did some Spock. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to get to your Spock stories as well, because you've got so many Trek stories. Uh, it's going to be tough to even try and narrow down my list of questions for you. But yeah, we'll get to Trek in a bit. Uh, but just to back things up a little bit, uh, can you tell us where you're originally from, who your parents were, what they did, and what little Tom wanted to be when he grew up? Well, I grew up in California, in Los Angeles area. And um, my parents were great, uh, great parents. Uh, my father was a tile contractor. My mother was uh, a housewife, and uh, she had she had a job on the side for a few years too, off and on. But uh, uh, I grew up and graduated from Burbank High School, went on to college. I graduated from Humboldt State, and um, got a degree in biology. And as I was working for the Forest Service, uh, I did a little show called uh, the. Uh, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And we did some, we were putting out a fire because I was working for the Forest Service at the time. So it got me interested. I came back to town and tried uh, following up to see if I could work as a stuntman. And I was successful in doing that. So that's how it kind of started. So you mentioned you went to school for biology. Were you trying to be a scientist or a conservationist? What was your original plan? Well, I was interested in forestry or wildlife and all that. And so I picked biology. I was interested in it. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't necessarily want to be a teacher, but uh, I liked working with the Forest Service. So I uh, was pursuing that at the time when all this other thing came down and changed my mind because I, I like action and I like physical things and that seemed to suit me better. So how does one pivot from science into Hollywood? How did you go from one to the other? Well, I lived in the you know, near the studios. I knew studio people, a few of them, and we were close to Universal Studios and the tours and all that. So, you know, I lived in that area and, and I, you know, everybody thinks about being in a movie sometimes. So I thought, well, hey, it'd be fun to give it a shot. I'd love to do some more stunt work. And, and when I inquired and searched out a little bit, I made a career path and pretty soon I was just involved. It was not a matter of, you know, pivoting so much. Um, kind of flowed together for me. So where did you go to start learning more about stunts? Because, you know, you got to learn how to fall. You got to learn how to take bumps. You got to learn how to take punches. Where did you go to learn these skills? Well, there's a uh, school in, in uh, uh, Santa Monica, used to be. It was taught by Paul Stater, who is a well-known stuntman, that uh, one of the few guys that would teach people in an in a actual class and that's where I met a lot of the people that uh, I worked with like Dennis Madelone and Chris Doyle and uh, Kenny a lot of a lot of the guys went there so I managed to find that school and start out and I spent about three years slowly building up getting a job here or there until I had uh, developed enough skills and like you say uh, that's where we learned everything from hot fights to falls to fencing and uh, a little bit of car work, all the stuff. We'd, we'd work out at the school in Santa Monica, and then we'd drive out to the valley where, where Bob Yerkes, who was from Circus, and he was a stuntman who came to the uh, 
stunt world for being a circus man. And so he had a whole trapeze in his backyard. He had huge poles. You go up for a 40 foot fall in the backyard uh, and all kinds of things that worked. And so we'd go from the school, especially on Saturdays and go over to Bob Yerkes. And then we work out in the trampoline, we do high falls. And so we had a real good training session uh, in those years where we could do, do a lot of training, meet a lot of people. And that's where we got our skills from. What was one of the hardest things you were learning back then that took you a little more time to pick up? I don't know. Everything has a learning curve. When you first start falls, you think it's pretty scary and then pretty soon it's not. And then you're going higher. And I don't know that there's one more than any other that was more particularly difficult. I mean, there's some things you have to spend time at, like fencing, where you have to actually learn, learn skills more than just learn how to, you know, physically do one thing. Um, Car work takes a little bit more, uh, you know, time to do different things. And horse work, I mean, it's, it's all, there's no one thing that stands out as a tough thing to learn. And some people are more natural to other things than others. And uh, for me, it was kind of, I took scuba, we, we practiced fireworks, we did all this stuff. Do you remember what your very first professional gig was? The, probably, if, well, the first, TV show I worked with the uh, Six Million Dollar Man. And uh, the coordinator had come down to the school and looking for somebody to do something. And uh, he had uh, asked around. I went over there and my first job was to be a hoodlum. I was with another stunt man and we were, uh, the, the Six Million Dollar Man was doing a drive along with the cops and they run into this uh, these two guys uh, harassing some lady in her car and chased us down the alley, et cetera. And so that was my first job on TV. And uh, one of the first jobs I did in film was the uh, lucky lady. That was a uh, Liza Minnelli, Gene Hackman uh, feature about drum runners and, and, uh, well, we filmed it in Mexico, and that was a lot of fun. I got to do a lot of different fights and falls and, and work with Gene Hackman on my first big stunt. He shot me, and I did a fall with a squib and, and fell down the, a bunch of boxes on board the ship, and uh, it's quite a big deal for me as my first big stunt. Yeah, I love Gene Hackman, too. I mean, that must have been surreal, having that be your very first movie gig, is to be face-to-face -face with Gene as he puts a bullet in you. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> So I read that you also worked on a show that was called uh, Man from Atlantis. Uh, That's before my time, but uh, I looked it up and I saw that you actually, in the episode you were in, you worked with Gene LaBelle. And yeah. I know Gene from my days of covering combat sports because he's like one of the most well-known people in this. You know, he, he taught Bruce Lee his many of the grappling holds. He ultimately put in Jeet Kune Do. He was the referee for the Ali versus Noki fight. Uh, and most famously, he choked out Steven Seagal. Uh, he's one of my favorite people ever. Uh, do you have any stories about working with Gene LaBelle? Well, yeah, when I first met Gene, um... We uh, were working on Man from Atlantis. He came in, he was gonna do a scene in a bar and be a bad guy and get in a fight. And he was just the greatest. And he, he says, I'm a, I always get beat up, I'm a bad guy or whatever. And he says, and he remember when we were sitting at the bar and he says, okay, uh, we're gonna do the fight. And he, Gene says, anything you want, we'll just work out whatever you like. Cause he had, you know, he had a bag of tricks nobody could do. And he was, Great, we did a, a fight, uh, and then in those days, Gene LaBelle was teaching his grappling at a school, LA Trade Tech, and I went down there a couple times, and then I got to know him, and uh, when I joined the Stuntman Association, um, I worked with him in different places, and matter of fact, I got a picture of him when he was uh, at his grappling studio. Uh, this is just a few years ago when he was helping with the uh, UFC and he had Ronda Rousey as one of his students and she was a well-known lady uh, UFC fighter. So I've known him for years and he's just one of the greatest guys. I'm glad to say I do know him. Speaking of Gene Lavelle, are there any veterans that you talk to, especially in those early days when you're coming up in the industry that you got some advice from or helpful hints? Well, a lot of them. Sure. I mean, uh, uh, Bob Trehune, uh was one of the first guys that I, I was doing The Man from Atlantis, and I was doubling for um, The Man from Atlantis. And 
uh, I had one episode where they had me coordinate. First time I was going to coordinate. And so I went to the Stuntman Association and book and I got uh, uh, Greg Walker and Bob Tehune and a couple of the other guys. And they came in and, you know, they didn't really know who I was. I have a show I'm doing. So, but they were the greatest. They really helped a lot. They were, they were there to help me. I had to do a bucking scene. And so they helped me. I had to flank this horse who wouldn't, who wasn't really a bucking horse. And so they, yeah, everybody worked with me I, and I got a lot from them. Um, Butler, Dick Butler, when I started doing Scarecrow, Mrs. King, he was the great help. And John Moyo started me out, one of the best features I did, I was doubling for Travolta and uh, we went to uh, New York. It was called Two of a Kind. It was Olivia Newton, John, and he really gave me a good start too. So he, he helped me a lot. So I, I've been blessed with a lot of guys that have done a lot for me in, in, uh, through the years. Was there ever a piece of advice that you got from any of these great stunt workers that you've held on to this day and that you've always used to this day in the industry? Oh, sure. A lot of different things. I remember one thing. Now, there's a stunt woman, Rita Eggleston, and she used to double for the bionic woman. And she was in Paul Stater's class. And here's a girl who's, you know, uh, learning to be a stunt person. She happened to be there before I was there. And I never forget when I first walked in and was doing some fights and she was there and we were doing oh, various punches and I took a stomach punch. She said, hey, wait a minute, you know, that, that's not the way you do it. You gotta buckle your knees when you take the stomach. You don't jump in the air, you're, you're something about it. I'll never forget her when I was first starting. Rita was, Rita explained to me how to take a stomach punch. When I have told other people about it, I always think of her and say, well, this is, this is how I learned to do it correctly from a stunt woman. And that was Rita. And of course, uh, fights and falls and all the things you learn from different people, there, there's always some significant things about it. And Paul Stater himself, of course, he was teaching the class. So you got to give credit to Paul Stater for a lot of things that we learn. And now, of course, you can't just tell us that she told you how to take a punch without telling us what that was. I want to hear what, what, the, what was the lesson? What's the way we should take a punch? Well, most people, uh, consider a stomach punch as something where you take a reaction and you kind of buckle yourself and, and, and pick yourself up, jump just a little bit backwards and up. Actually, to take a good reaction, when somebody's hitting the stomach, what happens is they go down, their knees buckle and they go straight down. And it looks more like you got hit with a stomach punch as opposed to doing this. So originally, or probably uh, initially, when somebody's trying to make it look good, take a stomach punch and lift themselves up. It doesn't happen that way. You got to take the punch the way it really looks. A lot of uh, body English tells you what you're looking at. So that's something that we learned when we were starting out, you know, what what really makes a, a punch look right and correct to the, to the audience because they're used to seeing what, what the body English shows them. And that's what you kind of, it's kind of like a mime where you have to learn how to do certain things to, to uh, make it look real. And that's some of the things you learn when you're starting out. Very, very cool. Now, I've read that you were also in Commando. You did some stunts on Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I love hearing Arnold stories. Uh, do you have any stories about working on that film? Well, yeah, it was, a, it was really actually uh, Hulk Hogan that I was working with. And uh, talking about uh, mime, that's what I was. I was a mime in this movie. Uh, wait a minute now. Which one did you say? Did you work in Suburban Commando, Commando. also? Oh, so, uh, yeah, I was, I was asking yeah. about Commando with yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm trying to get my movies mixed up. Did you yeah. work in both those films? Yeah, I worked in Suburban Commando, but I did work, yeah. With Arnold, we were all different bad guys, and and uh, uh, we got to take air rams and fight with Arnold, and and uh, it was that was another fun one that we did. And I think I was in a shed after, I was attacking with a, with a machine gun. And it was like a 30 caliber machine gun with, a, you know, with all the rounds on a, on a belt. And, and I came in to get him and he took a, a saw blade, a round saw blade and killed me with that and then took the machine gun. Now he was where had a machine gun for a while. So that was, that was fun. Yeah, Arnold was great. I heard some different stories about Arnold, especially, uh, you know, we, we interviewed uh, Alicia Knapp who worked with him on Total Recall. 
And she said, like, basically all the women were kind of warned about him. Uh, but I imagine it'd be a different thing for you guys. I mean, was he good oh, Good with stunt people? Oh, he likes stunt guys. Yeah, of course. He likes action. He likes stunt guys. So he, er, er, everything we did was fine. And, you know, he was uh, he was accommodating, always. But I can't let you get out of here now because you mentioned Hulk Hogan. I didn't know you were in Suburban Commando, too. So tell me about working with Hulk. Oh, <laughs> he was great. I, I guess, the, the you know, transition from saying mine to, to Hulk uh, you know, to do a suburban commando, but in the suburban commando, he was supposed to be an alien coming to, to earth and he didn't understand anything. And he sees one of the first things he sees is a guy down on, uh, you know, like in down on Santa Monica beach, they have a lot of characters around that, that, uh, are, you know, they're doing their thing, whether it's uh, singing or roller skating or whatever. But anyway, I'm a mime and I'm in there and the first thing he sees is me and I'm doing, I'm doing the walls. I'm, I'm trapped inside this wall. And so I'm doing all this kind of stuff. And he thinks I'm in a force field. He says, hey, buddy, I'll get you out of there. Well, Hulk hits me hard. I mean, I just, I went, you know, rolling backwards and hit the ground and all that stuff. And then he walks on. So that was all it was, but they thought it looked good. So they said, can we do another mine? So, okay. So later on, I was a guy that was uh, climbing a ladder. And I'm climbing a ladder. He says, hey, I'll help you out. Let me get you up there. And he throws me up on top of this thing. And of course, I crash. And he walks on. And then they said, let's do it again. Well, this time, we'll have you break character because, you know, I've been beat up. So third time, I'm wearing Band-Aids and, and stuff. And I'm doing a rope. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling this rope. And he comes up and he says, hey, let me help you with that. I said, no, oh, you take it. And I run off. <laughs> so it was kind of fun to be able to do a, a couple of scenes with him. Hulk was used to being in pro wrestling, so he's used to doing basically worked punches. But do you remember if you or any of the stunt coordinators or anybody else on the set had to kind of help him uh, learn to throw more realistic punches for the screen as opposed to what he was doing in the ring? No, I I'm, I didn't work with him on any punches, so I don't know if, if he wasn't, but he was pretty handy. I know that uh, he says he's going to pick me up and throw me because that's after he grabbed me, he was going to help me out and throw me up. But I, I said, well, here, how, how about I help you by put my arm on his shoulder? He said, well, what do you weigh? I said, well, about 100. So I, well, it is. You need help. And he started to pick me up. So I just stiffened up and gave him a little help. And, and, and it works a little easier. So you do have to work together. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I worked with him on that particular throw. But uh, he, of course, I'll tell you probably some of the most capable people to be stunt people would be wrestlers because that's what they do they gotta they gotta make it look good and they and they can't get hurt a lot of their stuff is real but a lot of it is too uh you know it's it's like a stunt man they 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 put something more into it yeah i know terry fung transitioned briefly into stunt work as well a little bit and i know stallone loved working with terry and a few other guys when he did uh paradise alley i think it was so yeah wrestlers transitioned pretty easily in this yeah, but it's like a boxer. They think a boxer make a great stuntman. But a picture fight is not a real fight because if it was a real fight, you'd, you, you, you'd, you'd lose because a real fighter would be able to take you out with a counter and everything else because you're making it looks like you're going to punch him. And they can see that coming and all this stuff which you have to show on camera so the audience sees it. Well, if you're in a real fight, the guy you're fighting is going to see it too. So you mentioned this uh, as we started this interview here that you were a double for Harold Ramis in Ghostbusters. And just to let folks know, you also doubled for Jeff Goldblum, Patrick Duffy, Tim Robbins, and many others, as well as Star Trek folks who we'll talk about a little bit later on. But uh, yeah, I'm a giant Ghostbusters fan, obviously. Uh, can you tell me some stories about working with Harold Ramis? Well, uh, he was directing as well. And so- Ivan Reitman was the director of that of that movie. Well, no, but Harold was up there directing okay. with him. Yeah, he was, he was doing a lot of that. Uh, himself so he, uh, he was in, involved in the production and so uh, he was kind of away from everybody a lot I didn't inter interact with him too much uh, you know when we're on a couple scenes where he's going to step in after you do one thing or another uh, there wasn't a lot to say so I didn't really talk to him too much uh, he seemed to be well he was always busy so a lot of times you don't really get to get to know the star or some of the actors you're you're doubling because they're they're pretty busy getting their dialogue doing their scenes and everything else so it's not like you're you know having a chance to hold a conversation with him but he was a nice guy from the bit i got to see see with him and talk with him 
And which stunts exactly did you do for Harold? Well, there was a couple things. Uh, when they had the street break open and a car fell in the in, in a crevasse and all of us Ghostbusters fell in. I did that for him. And then at the top where, um, uh, where I forgot her name, the one who was the- uh, the Sigourney Weaver? Yeah. Oh, we're she, talking about Zool, we're talking about Zool. Z yeah, she, she asked him, are you gods? You know, because they were, they were up there to stop her. And of course she, and they, he says, well, no. And then she gives him a bolt of whatever. And they all fall over almost off the, you know, down the stairs, almost off the building. So all that action, uh, the stunt guys did that for, for the Ghostbusters. Those are the major parts. Now for your scenes, were you wearing the master pack, which is like that 50 pound giant thing, or were you wearing the rubber stunt packs? It was the stunt pack, yeah. You know, when you're working, you're not real familiar. At the time, you don't know what all this equipment is. So I, I don't even know uh, what the real one or, you know, the one they used for the film, I had, of course, what we could use for the stunt, so it had, had a lot of rubber in it. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. If you're a Star Trek cosplayer looking for props or toy collector looking to spice up your shelves, Triple Fiction Productions has you covered. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. You can expect the same amount of care and attention to detail in any of the items in their catalog, whether it's a prop replica for use in a fan film, or part of a cosplay, or accessories and playsets for figures from Playmates, Migos, or Diamond Select. Own your very own tricorder or phaser rifle with working lights, the bridge of the Enterprise E for your Playmates figures, or any other item from countless species and ships from the Star Trek universe. All products are 3D printed in the USA and are constantly evolving and improving based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit them at triple-fictionproductions.net or on Facebook at facebook.com slash triplefictionproductions. Triple Fiction Productions taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. This is Lee Naff, AKA Ensign Sonia Gomez from Star Trek TNG, soon to get a promotion to captain on Lower Decks. Some of you may know me from my acting career, but a lot of you probably don't know me from my charity. It's called drivebydugaters.org. Myself and a bunch of teenage boys from the block, we all jump into my SUV every Sunday and we drive to the outskirts of town and right from the car window, we deliver water and wipes and protein and tarps and socks to our adult homeless who truly need it right now. I don't know if you know this, but in LA, there's not one single public bathroom and not one single water fountain for anyone. And out there in Skid Row, there's 11,000 people in 20 square blocks. So our water and our wipes are really needed. We go out every week and you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook or right on the website, drivebydugaters.org and throw in any amount, even a small amount is great. For instance, you can go on the website and when you click on donate, you can see where three bucks is going and what your money is going towards or where 17 bucks is going. Sometimes it's for cheese, sometimes it's for socks, sometimes it's for just what's really needed, which is water. Any holiday donations you might be deciding where to relegate, please consider drivebydugaters.org. It's also completely a tax write-off and every little tiny, tiny bit helps anywhere from $3 to $3 million. Your money goes directly to those who need it and we have no overhead, no agenda, pure giving and stay tuned for the animated version of Sonia Gomez on Lower Decks coming soon. Drivebydugaters.org, we drive by and what, we do, what do we do? We do good. Thanks so much. Hope to see you at my website. Bye. We now return to Trek Untold. All right, so Tom, let's jump into some Star Trek discussion. And there is a lot to talk about because your story with Star Trek begins with the very first motion picture. So right. uh, can you tell us just first off how you got into the motion picture and were you aware that you were auditioning for a Star Trek film? Yes, and I was asked to come down and do an interview. And fortunately, I looked pretty good as a stunt double. I had kind of Leonard's cheeks and... And uh, if you saw a picture of me dressed as Spock, it was a pretty good devil. And 
you know, I was new and I went in and somebody says, okay, come back or whatever it was. And they says, okay, we're going to hire you. And there you go. I, I almost thought that's the way it's done. <laughs> Not realizing that I was pretty fortunate to get this job. And it was tough. We had some hard moments, uh, particularly when we're in spacesuits on wires and you're in this complete spacesuit with a helmet and you're standing out, you're hanging out on the set uh, while they're fixing the lights in that spacesuit, it was like cooking a tomato. You're inside there just, you know, overheated. But I remember one time they brought me down, pulled that off, pulled the helmet off and the steam just was rising. I was about to go out. It was, it was so hot. But, you know, there, there's all these different experiences where you, that's what the stunt guy has to do. He has to take some of the hard stuff uh, that, uh, you know, you're not going to put the actor through. And then it can't, again, there was a lot of fun to play on, as well as Double Leonard uh, was kind of fun. And the uh, Klingons they created in the Star Trek motion picture were the new look for what a Klingon was. And I was one of the first ones to wear that makeup. And what do you think of that new style of Klingon makeup and the new wardrobe as well? Because the outfits are also very, very different. Uh, as a Star yeah. Trek fan, how, how was that for you? Well, it was great because uh, one thing, I went in at, early enough because I was doubling. They needed a, a basic model for some of this Klingon stuff. And I went in and they actually modeled me. I was six foot two, is about right height. So uh, some of that suits they did, they used me as as kind of the model for some of that. Uh, the suit itself was really good looking. I mean, the first Klingon outfit, the only difficulty is all these plates and stuff a little bit harder to work you know but it was still great and I remember the first time we put the makeup on it started right here on your nose and they glue it right in your nostrils they run this thing over your head and then bring it back as a matter of fact I had one you want to see it sure of course I had a uh, this oh, is wow. the uh, head mold that I had taken back there and they took my head mold and then they'd make the uh, piece that came off, uh, which was the original uh, aesthetic. And it glued from here, all around your eyes, back your head, all the way around in the back. And <laughs> the first time you put it on and get glued in, you know, that's an experience. And I know that once they put the face on, then they put the whiskers on. And when those, when they put those long whiskers on, I had them going all the way across here and they just touch your cheek and man, that was itchy. So, you know, you work for a day and it's just killing you. you say, then finally you get smart enough to say, well, listen, can we trim these a little bit right here? So I don't have <laughs> stuff like that. But that was my first experience with, with uh, glue and, and uh, rubber. Yeah, that's a heck of a way to have a first start in, uh, in the prosthetics. <laughs> yeah, head mold and everything. I was fortunate to have some neat things happen when I first started out. Now, you also returned for Star Trek Three, which Leonard Nimoy also was the director of. Uh, yeah. Do you remember, was he directing you in any of your scenes or was your stuff mostly second unit work? Oh, no, it was with Leonard. Yeah, I remember when Leonard was directing, I went into the production office and uh, they had another coordinator there at the time. And he was from the Stunts Unlimited group. And I was basically with on a stuntman's association. So I didn't figure I'd be doing too much because they'd use their guys for most everything. But Leonard says, oh, well, this is Tom Morgan. He's gonna be my double. And you know, the beginning where we have that alien, let's put him in there. And then uh, one of the Klingons, he'll, he'll be the Klingon that, that uh, will be on board. And then, um, when we do that scene in the bar, he can be one of the uh, he he can be one of the uh, Star Trek guys. Uh, and I'm just standing. There, oh God, this is great, you know, because I would never have been able to do any of that stuff. I would have just doubled Leonard and do whatever. But he, he was really great, and so I did a lot of different things in in the film. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's really amazing that Leonard was really standing up for you too. I mean, did you guys get yeah. much of a relationship when you filmed the first movie together? Well, not big. I didn't know that he'd feel that way necessarily until I got to the to his movie, 
I, you know, I see him a few times. He was a really nice guy and he, and I was a good looking double for him. So I guess he figured, Hey, that's great. And then when he's directing, he's going to use me and he's, well, you know, and his feeling is a feeling like, well, I'm going to take care of you too. You know, you'll have some other things you can do. So he just did that. <laughs> oh, that's really great. Yeah. Now, uh, in addition to the first film, and uh, you also did Wrath of Khan, I think as well, you did a few stunts in that too, right? Well, those are mostly uh, reuse of footage and, and mm. Wrath of Khan, I did, uh, I think just basically I was the guy in space spinning down across the Enterprise or something. So they just, I don't, I didn't actually, I think that was mostly just reuse of footage for me. So easy paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not too hard. <laughs> but you did come back in the fifth movie and you were the rock monster, which is from a scene that was ultimately cut from the film. Uh, can you tell well, us a little bit about being the rock monster? Yeah. They, they have different ideas of what the creature should be and they wanted to make it this or that. And, production had an idea and somebody else. So they created the rock monster. And this was a guy that we just completely looked like built of, with rock. And I had a complete prosthetics. And then they had, they even had a little teeny vent hole so they could blow smoke through me. And I'd kind of have a bit of smoke coming out between all the cracks and the rocks and stuff. And then I did several different scenes. And somewhere along the line, they decided that the rock guy didn't look right to them. He was a rock guy and he, and he, you know, he was too square and too little. And so they went with a voice and a, and a face and something else and, and all those scenes were cut. So I never got any of the pictures or any of that stuff. I, if I'd have been smarter, I'd have said, well, listen, can I make this before we do, you know, to myself, I might've been able to get something from a still man. I don't know. I'm sure there's some, you know, old photos somewhere in, in uh, Paramount's uh, vault that if you could, you could probably see what that thing was, but I didn't get them. That film was directed by William Shatner. And again, you got to work with him as well, I'm sure throughout all the other movies, but uh, this time mm -hmm. around as a director, I mean, do you remember what he was like to deal with? Was he actually directing your scenes? Oh yeah, well, he sure, he was directing and he was uh, like any director though. They're busy and they're doing their, you know, did this get that and, and we'll roll it and, and, but he seemed to be pretty good for me, you know. Um, uh, he, he directed the, the film um, like, uh, well, you know, he, had, he has his own approach. Every, everybody has their own uh, technique and their own vision. So you just go with what the director wants. And he was good. Nobody had big complaints. Do you remember if there was much of a difference in the directing style as from Leonard Nimoy to William Shatner? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think Leonard had a better, maybe a little better taste the overall, uh, what he's doing. Oh, Shatner was Captain Kirk and he was looking at it from the position of Captain Kirk, you know, uh, I'll say this and do that and then we'll shoot this. And then, you know, and it just, just makes a little bit of difference in that sense of the word where Nimoy was more, I think he, he had a little feel for the overall thing about how it's all, you know, what the storyboards are gonna do and how he's gonna all cut it together without the consideration of, oh yeah, well, I'll have to do this, I'm Captain Kirk. I mean, you know, just might be some of that. I do, I wasn't there enough to, you know, be real accurate. I, I, as a stunt guy, you work a number of days and then you're off and you come back, but if you were, one of the cast members might be able to tell you more of the difference between the two styles. Around the same time you did Star Trek V, I think you would have also have just begun doing Next Generation, right? Oh uh, yeah, we did TNG, sure. How did you get jump over to Next Generation? Was that through Dennis? Well, yeah, that was a real easy move because uh, first off, I was well known with the, uh, you know, the company itself. But Dennis Madalone had gotten started because when they first began TNG, they didn't have a stunt coordinator. They would vary. They bring in a, a director and he, you know, who do you want to do? Because we have a couple little stunts here. And they'd say, well, I got a guy, et cetera, et cetera. John Moyo came in one time and did it and he called me in and I did a little fall for him. And then all of a sudden Dennis Madel came in when he did his thing, he also did a little part and they liked it. And he just flat, I think, I think Madeline took it upon himself. He said, listen, uh, the next one I'm available, you know, if you want. And so he kind of got himself started and pretty soon he was the coordinator. Well, we were good friends and you know, I'm six foot two and Madeline's shorter. So 
you got to cling on, you got to whatever. He started using me right away and, and it all worked out. We meshed well, we worked well together. I was good for the different sizes of the characters. We understood uh, the kind of action we were shooting because we'd work together and learn together. So he just used me all the time. And that's what gave me kind of the, uh, uh, you know, the foot into the rest of the series. And I probably like did more aliens than any stuntman and maybe more than, uh, I'm sure there's somebody else who'd want to claim they did more aliens than anyone else, but I'd be right in there. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Your, your list of aliens is pretty absurdly big. I mean, You've been, as I mentioned, you've been Klingon, you've been a Borg, you've been a Cardassian, you've been a Bajoran, you've been Jem'Hadar, you've been a Kazon, a Romulan, a Zindi, a Breen, there's a ton of them. Which of those costumes did you dread having to do stunt work in? Well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, dread's not a good word, but uh, when, you're, when you're a Klingon and you're wearing the full-on Klingon uniform, it's hard to bring that batlet up with all these, that shoulder parts. So, you know, you, you just have to kind of make uh, adjustments for whatever it is. Uh, the one that was probably the most difficult in the sense that you can't do anything was when I did the swarm. And the swarm is this character who he's got a complete piece and it has a funnel for, I think I have a picture around here somewhere I could show you as we talk about it. But the swarm, let's show you right here. The swarm has got uh, this big nose and everything. All you have is a pair of eyes. So when they decided to have the swarm be the character for this episode that they were going to do and maybe be for that season, suddenly realized that they couldn't put an actor and he can't do anything. All I can do is look at you. <laughs> when that was a little more difficult, they had to cut it open for when you had lunch and then glue you back in. And it was a great styrofoam body piece that went with it too. So it was a little awkward to move in and to do some action in. So technically, that means you actually have an action figure. Did you know that? Because there actually is a Swarm action figure. Oh, I haven't seen the Swarm. I have a lot of different ones, some Borgs and, and Cardassians and, you know, the Madars and stuff. I've seen Swarm character. I'll have to check it out. That's good. <laughs> I think they're only used in one or two episodes. Yeah, it wasn't around actually, very long. The episode, but it's... Was, the episode, I think, was called the Swarm. Yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> So I wanted to actually ask you specifically about an episode from TNG also before we start jumping around too much here. Uh, there's an episode called Cupid where uh, Q basically sends all of the crew into basically Sherwood Forest and they're reenacting Robin Hood. And I heard that you were the one who had to train the cast in sword fighting. Do you remember doing that with the, with the crew? Yes, with some. Uh, I did that. Well, I did a lot of that kind of training. <clears throat> when, we, when we got introduced to Next Generation, uh, our, uh, they had the bat list, which was the tool for the Klingon, the, the, you know, the weapon of choice. And we learned that. So I did a lot of the training. When Dennis would be coordinating, we'd set up a fight. He'd say, okay, I gotta have this, go make me up a fight. So I'd put together a huge uh, fight with bat list. And then if he had other actors or stunt guys, I would train them. And then we'd bring that onto the set and we'd check it out. And Dennis would be able to, uh, I'd always give him more than we needed. And he'd cut this out, put that, and we'd scramble stuff again. Pretty soon we had a fight. Well, I did a lot of that training, and I helped uh, with uh, you know, some of the sword work, too, with, other, with some of the actors. That's one of the things I did for, uh, you know, for the stunt department. So who was most handy from the stars uh, to be able to like pick up the sword fighting and all the stunt stuff really quick? And who needed to do some extra homework? Oh, I don't know. It wasn't uh, anybody in particular. I know that uh, Worf... Uh, Michael Dorn was pretty good himself with the with the bat list. He had trained uh, with uh, when it was originally made, and so he had some of his own moves he used too. Uh, our fights were not really that extensive. In other words, you could pretty much pick it up. And most actors are are have uh, you know a little bit of ability. I can't think of anybody who was really. I mean, I worked in business long enough I've been with some actors from some show that just they couldn't even throw a punch and here you got to work with them but we didn't have any of that really happen on Star Trek for the most part most of the actors and actions were pretty good. Now, Dennis I mentioned you're also responsible for the creation of a lot of those Klingon weapons is that true? Well some uh and not the Klingon necessarily but uh, particularly when you go to a production meeting and they say okay we got these characters now we're going to do this we're going to do that and you'll have a weapon that does this and 
and they'd always give you something that a prop master would build. And it was always something that was awkward. It was made to look really good and it was not necessarily well balanced. And they'd hand it to you and say, now you gotta be real careful with this because it'll break if you do that. And there's a light in here, so you can't touch it, you know? So now we're in a production meeting to do one of the shows that had a lot of action to it. And um, uh, I'm in the production meeting with Dennis at the time. We're in the morning and they're gonna block out basically what they're gonna do. They'll have another meeting in the afternoon. And when they came by the stunts, I'm sitting there and Dennis is talk they're talking to Dennis and they said, okay, we're gonna have a pole arm for these guys. Uh, it's called battle lines and there's two tribes that fight each other and they can kill each other, but they come back to life. So they're always fighting. And they said this and that, and I'm looking at Dennis and he's, yeah, okay. And as soon as he passed to the next thing you're talking about, I got a hold of Dennis and I said, listen, why don't we try to design something that'll work for us? He said, well, what do you wanna do? I said, let me go home. I'll come back in the afternoon for the next meeting. We'll have something. So I went home and I designed this thing. I used an, uh, a sledgehammer handle and I cut out uh, cardboard for the blade and the way it was attached and sprayed it all silver and glued it on and put a ball in the bottom of it. And so it looked like a nice pulley. You could use it two ways. You could use the butt end of it. You could cut with it, you could jab with it. And that was great. So we brought that and now we're in the afternoon and they says, okay, now with the stunts and Dennis says, well, can we make a suggestion? Could we have the prop people make something like this? <laughs> and they says, oh, well, that's fine. Okay, so we gave it to props and eventually they made the, the weapon that we used. So I did design one for sure. And then we, we had suggestions for everything if we could, you know, you try to make it so it's workable. And on that topic of Klingons, by the way, I know you did a lot of doubling work for J.G. Hertzler, General Martok on Deep Space Nine. Uh, do you have any stories about working with J.G.? Well, this was me doubling JG, and you notice that I had both eyes open. He was supposed to be blinded in one eye. So when I put the makeup on me, they just made an extra piece on my eye. In fact, I could close my eye and it looked like it wasn't there. So I had the advantage of, of not having to fight blind uh, when, I was, when I was doubling him. As long as my back was to the camera, I could have two eyes open. When I turn around, I'd close it. So it helped me with it. I did a lot of fighting for him, and it was a lot of fun. We did did a lot of different things. He was, he was, a he was pretty active Klingon. So, um, yeah, Hertzler was a good guy. I know I saw him once at a convention and he, uh, uh, he was going to do a talk. And so we worked together kind of like I was the stunt guy. I got along pretty well with JG. And that was for Deep Space Nine. That show in particular, I think probably had some of the most like intense action scenes because you'd have like massive group battles happening all the time, especially Jem Hadar and Cardassians. You'd have a lot of those types of battles. Uh, can you remember any days on set on Deep Space Nine where it was just a really crazy shoot day with one of those big battles? Oh yeah, sure. The day of the, when they first brought on Klingons, I uh, can't think of the name of the episode. It was... Um... Are you talking about Way of the Warriors, season four? I, Way of the Warriors, you got it. That's it. Way of the Warriors was just, I mean, we had go in all directions. And uh, uh, we'd fight this way, we'd fight that way. We'd get killed over here and then we'd get shot over there. At one time, I think I was doubling. And uh, I I think I, uh, I even shot myself. So I'm here doing something and then I'm over there getting shot. <laughs> there was a lot of good action. We liked Nick. Uh, the Deep Space Nine series. We got to do all kinds of characters. Now, since you worked on pretty much TNG, DS9, Voyager, and Enterprise, uh, what would you say the differences were between the type of stunts you would do on those shows? Uh, they all were similar, I and mean, you're fighting, and that's the main thing, and you'd have different weapons, so you would do a different kind of fight, but uh, for the most part, uh, you were an alien, you know, and you had whatever you were dressed like, you know, predicted, you know, it, it, it kind of necessitated something you had to do differently, but uh, most of it was getting shot, falling, reacting, and using a weapon. So they were, they were all pretty similar, and unless you had to do a, a, a fall, you know, or something else. There was one time um, I had to uh, do a, a setup where um, I was doubling uh, for number two, uh, and the, the deal was he, the aliens were trying to, uh, uh, abduct 
you know, people just like you hear about abductions anyway. So I was supposed to be levitated off of bed and then taken through a wall. And that means that I'd be brought up and then just kind of eased on through and horizontally. Well, to do that shot, we had to do a fall and I had to fall straight like as if I'm laying in our bed. So I had to fall completely straight and then hit the ground, which I had to catch it for, and then I could fall out, roll out. And we had to do that from uh, the top of the green beds. So they had enough footage for me to go and they turned the camera sideways and I'd fall. So it was a big setup. So in that sense of the word, it, you know, there's, there's things you have to adjust for and then and create some technology to make it work. And then of course they slow that fall down. It looked like I was just being drifted away. So Dennis mentioned that probably the most uh, exciting stunt for him was an episode where he had to actually be set on fire. Uh, for you working on all the Star Trek shows, what would you say is maybe the craziest or most intense stunt that you got to do? Well, I was with him on the fire. I was a safety, one of the safety men too. That was a pretty, pretty good day. Uh, he's done a couple of fires. He had one really good fire, that uh, scene where he had to run through a burning hall and out. And, and uh, that, was, that was a pretty good day then. I've had all kinds of different things. I'm trying to think uh, if there's any one that was, uh, I liked sword fighting and I know we did one tapestry where, uh, well, I was doubling for Barkley in an episode called Tapestry where he was in the holodeck and he was uh, fantasizing that he could out swordsman any of the guys in the crew and, and, and the, they were uh, fighting him and he was taking them all. And that was a lot of fun because we got to put together a whole sword fight and of course, at that time I was a hero, I was being everybody. So <laughs> that was one of the ones that was kind of a, a, exceptional for me. And uh, there was one other Star Trek movie that you got to work on. And that was uh, the last TNG movie, Nemesis, where you got to play one of the Reman aliens. Can you tell us a bit about being a Reman? And uh, as a follow-up, I had read that that costume had a second life a little bit later on in Enterprise, specifically for you. Well, the Remans were basically uh, the main character for, for that movie and uh i was brought in because they fit me pretty good it was about the right size and i did a couple things there and often they'll put your name in the costume well i had been to wardrobe for years and so everybody knew me and and uh, evidently my name was in the Riemann costume and when they started to zindies on uh enterprise they saw my name in the costume and they needed people that could fit them, they called me. So I got a job just because of the costume on that one. And once I, once I was there again, of course I did several of the Zindis and those are real interesting characters. If you look at them closely, you can see the Riemann uh, wardrobe redone. So you could tell the basic part of the wardrobe could easily have been uh, from the feature. So back when we spoke with Dennis, he mentioned uh, being a Jem'Hadar alien as one of the toughest ones that he had to do. Uh, and he mm -hmm. talked about specific, uh, specifically an episode where you guys were out in uh, a very dry, arid part of California in the full of Jem'Hadar outfits. You guys were dropping left and right. Uh, do you remember that day as Jem'Hadar sweating it out? Of course. Fortunately for Dennis and I, because we worked a lot, we were, you know, we had built up our cardio for this kind of thing. It was very difficult because we were, we were at uh, one of the quarries. It was actually where they turned into a you know, where they dump stuff. So it was, you know, it, it was uh, a hot day and we were down in the quarry and it was really hot. I remember, in fact, Dennis took and split the top of his Jemadar and put a, put a water, or just a bottle of water down his head. <laughs> and it was tough. They had us, they had a car with air conditioning and they keep it running and we could go into the car and sit there or the van and in between takes because you just couldn't stay out there you're completely covered with thick rubber it'd be like wearing a wetsuit uh with a you know wetsuit face and everything and standing out in the sun you, you, you just couldn't do it so we'd have to sit in this van in between takes and then go out there and go for it again it was it was a very unusual day <laughs> So unrelated to Trek, I wanted to mention also that you won a Taurus Award, which is uh, the Oscar equivalent for stunt performers. And uh, you and your team won for Best Fight in Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. Uh, I've seen it referred to as the Wheel of Fortune scene. Uh, it's a really great, great scene where uh, it's basically a three-way dance and you guys are fighting on a decrepit castle and then a bell tower and then finally uh, on a rotating water wheel and then you finally land on a beach. Uh, I just watched it the other day to prepare for this and it's a really really great crisp fight scene, a really wonderful action scene. Uh, so I'd like to hear a little bit about working on that particular scene 
uh, and just how that all came together, because that's got a lot of pieces to put that one together. Well, that's a big running battle, of course it is. And, and uh, Tom DuPont was the main uh, stuntman and was sitting with blade work for it. Uh, and uh, George, uh, our coordinator, uh, is a master swordsman himself. So he knows all about sword work, but uh, you know, being busy with all the coordinating duties he had, Tom DuPont, who was a great stunt uh, swordsman himself, put a lot of that stuff together and helped create it all. Now, when it came to me, I was on the beach part of the scene where we're at a big running fight there and, and a lot of pieces and a lot of parts. And that was great fun to shoot. We were in the Bahamas. Uh, I think that's where we're in the Exuma Island and out in the sun out there in the middle of the ocean. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and it took a lot of work because you rehearse and rehearse until you get it right. And then you have actors to come in and you have to work with them. And of course, Johnny Depp was included. Um, and uh, it, I, I thought the sequence was great once it was put together like you had seen. It, it went from everywhere. And, and especially on that rolling deal where he was fighting, uh, that went by the forest or, you know, the palm trees in the island and, and it was just a lot of moving parts to that whole fight. So I guess we're lucky and we got uh, selected for a Taurus Award. Well, there's no luck involved. That was just a really, really great scene. It, it's easy <laughs> to see why that was chosen. Uh, and you're yeah. just again, like for me, I, I like watching uh, stunt scenes and typically a fight scene is usually one-on-one -on -one. or in the case, maybe it's like, you know, it's, it might be right. a group fight, but it's still groups and they're one versus one. In this case, it's one versus one versus one. I think that's so rare in fight scenes and that presents a lot of interesting challenges to choreograph. Uh, do you remember much oh, yeah. about how that, how the actual fight between the three actors got put together and how that was all worked out? Well, uh, I, I wasn't, of course, privy to all the creation of that. That was the, well, like I say, Tom DuPont and, and uh, George uh, Ruge, who was the coordinator, they, they worked out the basics for that. But um, it just takes, uh, it's like a dance if you think of it as choreography and you have to Put everything together and you have to practice each section and um, you know learn the technique and it it's it's just a matter of time putting it all together if they give you the time to do it you can do a good job with it sometimes when you have those big scenes and they have you know they don't want to they don't want to give you that much time to put together in fact they cut pieces out of it so it can be difficult but that that one was the the time they, they allowed for us uh and for uh, them to put it together was was uh, adequate for the job. And I can't do this interview without talking about The Artist as well, which you worked on back in 2011, which won a lot of awards, nominated for 10 Oscars. It won five of those. Uh, you were the sword fight choreographer in that film, and that must have been a very interesting set to work on. Do you remember much about being on that set? Of course. Yeah, that was a, that was a lot of fun. Uh, it, was, it was a little disappointing in the fact that I had a knee injury at the time, so when I started the... Uh, fight with uh, you know with the stunt guys in it and it uh, I couldn't do the shoot itself because I had a bad knee I brought in uh, uh, Brian Williams to take my part but I was able to uh, set the, the basic uh, blade work with it because we were going in uh, to do the original uh, rehearsal and figure it out uh, uh, I put together a fight because they said, well, bring some ideas. Well, I made a whole fight. I put it together. We went to Mark Donaldson's house. He was one of the stunt, court, uh, stunt guys on it. And um, we uh, started using my routine. They said, that's things. So they just used my whole routine and we modified the stuff we needed to. So I actually got to set that. I don't think I got screen credit for it because I wasn't uh, actually uh, shot. Uh, you know, I wasn't in the shoot. But it was a lot of fun to put it together and a lot of fun to see it happen and to think that uh, I actually had a hand in doing some of the choreography on, on a, you know, award-winning movie. That was kind of fun. So as a film fan and a stunt performer, are there any fight scenes that you really like to watch or any movies in particular that really stand out to you as one of your favorites because of the action or stunts involved in them? I like a lot of stuff. When I was growing up, I was a John Wayne fan. That was my big hero. And so all the old cowboy stunt fights and John Wayne fights were great. I like those. Um, and uh, today there's just lots of action and, and with martial arts having been brought into it, 
uh, I'm, I still have my own copy of Enter the Dragon and I watch that all the time or, you know, occasionally because Bruce Lee set the, the bar for, for martial arts. And I, I think that's just one of the greatest films for action. And then um, there's been so much wire work done and, and effects that included uh, computer graphics. It's, the action we have these days is just really way over the top. And um, I can't think of any one thing offhand. I know I saw the, uh, we, we looked at the Expendables and they had not a lot of neat action in that. Um, you can name a lot of films that they that currently being done and just, you know, in the past few years, they, when they put the action in those, um, you know, they're really great. And, and so the superhero movies as well, you know, you're doing things like, like Spider-Man or Superman that it's impossible. And when they put all the technology together and make a, a fight with that, uh, it's great. It just, like you say, I think most movies are sold by their action. If you look at trailers, what is a trailer? It has some, you know, dramatic scenes, but uh, most of that stuff's got action in it to bring the people in. Now, I'm glad you brought up Enter the Dragon also. You know, for myself, like I do appreciate a lot of the stunts today that incorporate the CG. Like, you know, I think that one we mentioned in Dead Man's Chest has definitely some CG in it. But I'm always a fan oh, yeah. of, uh, in particular, Sammo Hung and Jackie Chan, probably more so Sammo, oh, um, because I yeah. think, you know, he incorporates so many great Buster Keaton elements, some comedic elements in the stunts also. I'm a big fan of his work. I got to do the first movie that he did in the United States. It's called The Big Brawl. With Jackie Chan. I don't know if you heard of it, but yes, uh, he was back, so much back before he even really spoke much English. Right, he was terrific. When I first saw this, I couldn't believe the stuff he did. He didn't have safeties either. You know, he he didn't safety himself off like we would today. He, I know, one time he was climbing a power uh, uh, power line structure. Uh, you know. And he was swinging from one to the other. He's up doing his thing. And then one time we were in a, a fight in a theater and he jumped off the balcony down to the aisle and ran down the aisle and started a fight. And this was for real. You know, he just did it. And he was a lot of fun. So right now we're doing this interview and it's still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and the film industry at this point starting to get things back up and running in dribs and drabs. But uh, how do you foresee the future for stunts being changed once things start to normalize? I don't think it's going to be, you know, once it's once we have a vaccine and everything's back to normal, it will be just like the usual. I think right now, uh, you know, the the things you have to do because of, of uh, you know the pandemic. Like I think the way they're doing everything, now, they have masks, they have shields. Uh, you have to keep distance, and you can only the actors have to wait till they actually are filmed before they take anything off. So all this protocol is very expensive as well, because they got to do testing, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's very difficult for uh, independent movies, film companies and smaller companies to, to do it. Uh, but eventually, I think this will all go back to what we had. It takes time. You just got to live with what you're working with. So Tom, these days, are you now retired from working in the, in the industry? Um, not completely retired. I haven't worked for a few years, but uh, I, uh, don't consider myself out of it completely. I'll be doing some things. I had uh, uh, some business has taken me away. And uh, when you get older, sometimes you don't get all the parts you uh, did when you were younger. So it slowed down a little bit, but I'm not completely out of it. All right. That's good to know. So we could hopefully see Tom Morga at some time back in 2021 on screen again somewhere once things are back to normal. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> So, Tom, last question for the day. What is the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? I think the best part of the Star Trek universe itself is the fans. Uh, I know when I first started and did the feature, the Star Trek the motion picture, I had really no idea uh, where it would go from there. And I thought that was basically a single film that was just bringing the cast together again. And then as uh, Next Generation started and we started working on that and all the things that happened, it was real for me, just to have been able to play all these aliens and do all these shows, um, it's just a big part of my career. And it had, has a lot of personal uh, meaning for me, and just to be able to say I'm part of that Star Trek universe. 
Tom, thank you so much today for telling us all your stories about working in Star Trek and some other projects you've been on. Uh, you know, I always love talking with stunt performers. You guys just have so much knowledge. And uh, yeah, something I've told Dennis in the past, you guys are the invisible warriors. So thank you for all the bumps you've taken, and all the beatings you've taken on behalf of folks who weren't able to do that. Well, my pleasure. And I'm glad you have some interest in it. That always makes it better for us. That was our chat with Tom Morga, who has so many more things I'd love to learn about. So don't be surprised if we happen to have him back on the show sometime again soon. And to be completely honest, I would love to get him and Dennis Madalone back together in one episode to have a nice roundtable discussion about stunts on Star Trek and everywhere else they've been. It's never, ever a bad thing to have stunt performers reminiscing about all the different work they've done. And if that's something that you'd like to hear also, don't forget to let me know in the comments or on social media. Now, Tom Morga has one other Star Trek connection that we didn't discuss today, and that was for the fan-made series Star Trek New Voyages. In the episode World Enough and Time, Tom was the fencing coach for George Takei. And if you're interested in seeing what his work looked like, you can check that episode out on YouTube right now, where it currently has over 1 million views since its debut back in 2012. So if you like fan shows, this is definitely a good one to check out. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Trek Untold. If you aren't already, please make sure you're following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Trek Untold. And if you'd like to watch the video version of this podcast when available, make sure to check out youtube.com slash nerdnews today. And don't forget you can also check out teespring.com slash stores slash Trek Untold to check out all the Trek Untold merchandise we have, or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash Trek Untold. Any contribution you can make helps keep this ship running at optimum power. But even just listening to the show and telling your friends about it does a pretty big thing for us too. So please leave a rating and review if you're listening to this in the audio form, or give the video on YouTube a thumbs up and sub to the channel. There's no wrong way to help Trek Untold out, so whether you're just dropping a review, giving us ratings, or if you're able to offer us any support monetarily, we thank you so much for doing that, and we also thank you for again choosing to listen to Trek Untold. Once again, thank you to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions. If you'd like to send us some feedback, suggest a guest, or ask to be booked as a guest on this show, or provide a sponsorship opportunity at Trek Untold, please email me at trekuntold at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you and hear your thoughts on what you thought about this week's episode and our guest. I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, this has been Trek Untold, and until next time, fortune favors the bold. <laughs>